to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Brian Barnwell, who's the, uh, let's see, technically he's the emergency physician in chief at uh, Emergency Medicine Tufts Medical Center. Um, actually started in the Midwest at Northwestern, went west and then came east, and so he's been here for a long time. Uh, in charge of the emergency room at Tufts Medical Center, and I think hopefully we'll uh, elaborate some more information for us about a problem that we all face with regard to a real knot in the system in a lot of respects, with due respect to the emergency room, but it tends to be a problem in terms of getting people moving through and getting people to where they need to go. It's a necessary resource, but I hope he'll give us some, uh, some ideas with regard to how the system works and how it can work better. So, Dr. Palmer. <coughs> Well, thanks for that introduction. It's great to be here in uh, Lowell. It's, I always have a great time when I come up here, and especially when you come in the morning. So it's, uh, I come from Newton, so it's a, it's a nice commute and uh, very clear and beautiful day to, to come up here. So um, I am here to talk about department, uh, emergency department visits and uh, why do people come to the emergency departments and, gee, I, you know, how do you keep them out? So in order for me to do that, I really have to understand, at least it would be helpful for me to understand my audience a little bit. So the people here, um, if you could just help me out. Who here, just raise your hands. I know you can't do that uh, if, you're, if you're listening, if you're um, uh, streaming this, but... Um, uh, if you consider yourself, whatever your specialty may be, but if you consider yourself a primary care provider, can you just raise your hand and that help me out? Okay, so a couple in the audience um, are primary care providers, and that would be helpful um, to me. Uh, another thing that's just going to be a little bit helpful to me, if we take a, a little bit of a survey, and I like to do this sometimes with my talks, and if you just help me out a little bit, um, so, how many here have actually been to an emergency department to yourself? You know, you had to go for yourself. Just, just raise your hand up there. So, a lot of people in the audience. And for those that didn't, you know, how many people accompanied somebody else uh, to the emergency department? You didn't go yourself, but you accompanied somebody else. Okay. So, but, but a lot of people there. And if, if you haven't raised your hand, how many people know somebody that went to an emergency department? Probably everybody is going to raise their hand there. Okay. So. Um, everybody is familiar with the emergency department. Now, I do have to talk a little bit about some disclosure. So when I talk about this particular subject, I am an emergency physician, no question about it. And I get paid for seeing patients. I do not get paid for not seeing patients. And so the first time I was asked to give this kind of a talk, it was probably about five, six, seven years ago, and it was to a NEQA group, um, and it was a NEQA group of pediatricians. And they were kind of very interested in knowing how do we keep our patients out of the emergency department? And they asked me to give that talk. And I thought, well, this is kind of strange because you're asking me to tell you how to keep the people who uh, I rely on to pay my bills and send my kids to college at the time and all that kind of stuff. How do I keep them out? But it was an interesting topic to me because I'm just as frustrated as anybody else when I'm working a shift in the emergency department and I see a patient and I take care of their problem. And I always ask, you know, do you have a primary care provider who is your primary care provider? And most of them do. Most, of them, most patients have a primary care provider, but for whatever reason, they happen to be in the emergency department that day. And uh, when we conclude, and everything is great, and do you have any questions? And no, I don't. Um, I do have one question, doctor. I have an appointment in about an hour and a half with my primary care doctor. Should I keep that? <laughs> and I kind of chuckle a little bit, and um, I always say yes, but, you know, gee, you were, you were here. We took care of a problem. May have been an urgent problem, may not have been an urgent problem, but you had an appointment to see your own doctor an hour and a half from now, but yet you came to the emergency department. And, and you can't really ask, why did you do that? You know, I mean, people do in the emergency department, don't get me wrong. I have um, staff all the time, it, you overhear it, and you cringe when you hear that phrase, why did you come to the emergency department? Um, and you go, gosh, don't ask them that, because again, we, we get paid for seeing patients, we don't get paid for not seeing patients. And so there's this conflict, and let's talk about the conflict a little bit more. Hospitals do rely on emergency department volume. Okay, they just do. And uh, you guys see a lot of patients here, appear more than we see in our emergency department. We see about 47,000. I think you probably see about double that. Um, and you know, the outpatient uh, volume is important to hospitals. It is, it is key to, to drive the economy of the hospital. It isn't the, the master thing that drives the, the economy of the hospital. Of course, uh, what drives that? Well, inpatient admissions drive that primarily, and of inpatient admissions probably be procedural things and operative cases and those sort of things. We all know that, you know, uh, 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 no money, no mission, we hear that all the time. 
and a certain number of percentage of hospital admissions always come from the emergency department. In our place, it's about 19, 20%. It's pretty low. Uh, I think we have the lowest admitting percentage in all of the academic medical centers in Boston. And 19 to 20% is extremely low. Some hospitals have as high as 70% admissions through the hospital and uh, or through the emergency department. And hospitals do rely on those admissions coming through. You know, it's a big deal. Um, those are the profitable sorts of patients. It isn't so much the outpatient volume, although you can get some more, a little bit more sophisticated and look at downstream revenue and capture and that sort of thing. Right, so um, if I was asked my friend, uh, Dr. McDonald there, um, you know, hey, has anybody ever asked you to see fewer patients? Has a CMO or a CEO or a CFO ever come to you and say, uh, Nathan, you're seeing too many patients in the emergency department. I've never had any kind of emergency department director ever relate that conversation. You guys are seeing too many patients in the emergency department. Okay, just the opposite. It's how can we get more patients to the emergency department? We want more volume in the emergency department because that is a feeder system. And in fact, a lot of uh, programs exist out there to drive patients to the emergency department. So we use something called InQuicker in uh, our ED, and that's uh, if you go, if you log on to the Tufts website, you'll see that and say, book your appointment in the emergency department. And I cringed when I first kind of saw that years and years ago. Gee, an appointment in the emergency department? Well, what's all that about? Um, and so what that system is, it, it allows somebody to say, hey, I think I need to come to the emergency department. It's probably a non-urgent visit. And the, the feeling is that that person is going to seek medical care somewhere no matter what. And so that system allows them to get in line, if you will, and it allows them to wait wherever they want to wait. If they want to wait in their office at work or in their family room at home, that's fine. They get credit for that wait time. So when they show up at their time of their visit, they get that one hour wait or two hour wait credit. So they walk right in. Oftentimes it's into our urgent care center in the emergency department and they see uh, they get seen. And patients love that. And we only see about 120 patients per month out of that system on a volume of somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 patients. So it's not huge, but it does drive a certain demographic of patient and that patient is a younger patient, about 60% female, about 60% don't have a PCP, um, are new to the system. They are mobile savvy, they're computer savvy, they're employed and they're insured, right? Who doesn't want that demographic? And they don't, they're not linked to any system. They're not linked to any system at all. And that's why that system exists. Um, if you drive around, you'll see billboards, you know, wait time of X, uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 5 minutes, 0 minutes, right? All of those systems are built to drive volume to the emergency department. And who's paying for those? Hospitals are paying for those. So there's a conflict. You know, we have patients who are being driven to the ED. Uh, we have emergency physicians who want to see patients because that's how we get paid. But yet, there's this whole population of patients who probably don't belong there. We can agree on that, trust me. We can agree on that, that there's this population of patients that really do not belong there. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is talk just about a couple of patients briefly. This is just some brief stuff here. And we'll come back at the end and we'll talk to them. And I kind of toyed around, well, how much do I really want to tell you about these patients? And pro so probably right now, not too much. but. Uh, we'll go through them here. 28-year-old female requesting a medication refill. Okay. These are all patients who I saw in the emergency department last week. Okay, so real patients that I saw recently. We can all picture this patient in your mind. I'm not going to tell you anymore. Was it an urgent visit? Did they need to come to the emergency department? Why did they come to the emergency department? And we're going to get there. A 25-year-old female requesting a pregnancy test in the emergency department to be seen. Okay. A 58-year-old female with severe back pain, radiculopathy, ongoing for years. She's in the emergency department. A 28-year-old female with a lump under her arm for two months. She's in the ED. Okay. These are all real cases. Um, after I set up this talk, and I want to thank Karen for helping me out. I think I was a thorn in her side. Uh, she's extremely organized, as is your whole program. I am not. Um, so thank you, Karen. Um, I realize that these are all females. It's not to say that um, 
all of these kinds of visits are, are um, female. They absolutely are not. This just happened to be that came right off my list of charts that I needed to do, and I just plucked them right in order. Okay? All right. So keep those cases in mind. We will come back to them uh, towards the end of the talk. So can we ide even identify the problem? So we're going to really narrow this down now to non-urgent visits. Okay, so the patient comes in with a knife in their chest or a bullet hole in their... We're not talking about that patient, right? They need to be in the emergency department. There's no question about that. There's no debate about that. They need to be there. So what are we talking about? Can we even identify the problem? And uh, there are all kinds of percentages out there. What is the percentage of non-urgent visits that are seen in the emergency department? Okay, well, that ranges anywhere from 6% to 70%. That's what I've seen in the literature so far, and we'll get to that a little bit. So here's a study, the comparison of presenting complaint versus discharge diagnosis for identifying non-emergency emergency department visits. And this was in JAMA, uh, I think in uh, 2013, something like that. And um, I like this, because, number one, is because the second author on this, Robert Lowe, is a guy who was one of my mentors in, in training. And what they decided to look at was, well, how does all this information come about? You know, why are there such uh, divergent percentages of non-urgent emergency department visits out there? Uh, and there's debate about that. And so a lot of this is decided on the discharge diagnosis. Okay? In fact, there are several states across the country, Illinois uh, being one, that uh, they, the Medicaid folks there took the stance of, based on the discharge diagnosis, we're going to decide not to pay. We're not going to pay the provider for uh, the care that's delivered in the emergency department. Now, that hasn't hit Massachusetts yet, but it, it probably about a half a dozen states across the country have taken that position. But based on the discharge diagnosis, we are not going to pay the provider. Um, that's a tough stance to take, especially if you're the provider. Um, but so what they wanted to do is they looked at uh, a database, a government database, of about 34,000 visits. And there was a certain percentage in there that were um, labeled as non-urgent visits. And so what they decided to look at, well, what was the chief complaint for those visits? What was the emergency department course? And then what was the discharge diagnosis? So here's the, the summary of this, comparison of the presenting complaint versus discharge. Um, 34,000 unique emergency department visits that they, they looked at and reviewed. And again, identifying the primary care treatable visits and the chief complaint. So they looked at the final disposition. 6.3% had primary care treatable diagnoses based on the discharge diagnosis. Um, primary care treatable di patients had the same, it shouldn't be diagnosis, chief complaint, chief complaint as 89% of all ED visits, okay? So chest pain is chest pain, right, until it's an MI versus a costochondritis. You can't really figure that out. So let's subdivide those and let's look at these primary treatable and so what happened to them? Well, 11% were identified as requiring immediate or emergency care. And that's about 250 patients in the ballpark. 12% required hospital admission and 3.4% were admitted directly to the operating room. So these were patients who had primary care treatable based on a New York algorithm that's commonly used to identify non-urgent visits out of a database. So that's how this thing is, is, is worked. So you would agree that those patients probably needed to be seen, but yet they're labeled as non-urgent visits. So the conclusion among ED visits with the same presenting complaint of those ultimately given primary care treatable diagnosis, a substantial number required immediate emergency care or hospitalization. And so the discharge diagnosis, which again, many studies use to identify non-urgent visits really can't be used in an accurate sort of way. We need something else. The something else doesn't exist yet. I'm here to tell you that. It does not exist yet. It can, there continues to be a debate. All right? Let's look on another study, national uh, study of non-urgent emergency department visits and the associated resource utilization. So do non-urgent visits use resources and how are those resources differ from urgent or emergent cases. Interesting study. This was done um, by some folks down at, at BI. And this is the summary. So here 
10% of patients were defined as non-urgent. The previous study, about 6.8, let's call it 7. 7% were identified using that algorithm as non-urgent. In this study, 10% identified as non-urgent. About 90% of uh, non-urgent visits had some sort of treatment, and about 30% had some imaging done in the emergency department. Okay? So they did get treatment, and they got imaging. You might say, well, the counter-argument is, gosh, if they had come to me, the primary care provider, I might have known that they had a CT scan or an MRI scan or something like that, and they wouldn't need imaging. So um, maybe this artificially inflates things a bit. I'll give you that. Procedures performed in 34% of non-urgent visits versus 56% of the emergent and urgent care visits. So. Um, Probably most people that need a procedure done need that procedure done um, quickly, timely. The medications used were about equal in both sides, 80%, 76%. And hospital admissions for the non-urgents were 4% versus this national average of, or in this study, 20%. So um, still 4% of non-urgent visits ended up getting admitted to the hospital. I remember these. Retrospectively, we would call these, they aren't non-urgent visits. They're urgent visits. They got admitted. But the algorithm identified them as non-urgent visits. All right, so critical care admissions, uh, half a percent versus about 3.5% for most uh, hospitals. Uh, so what's the conclusion here? It's tough to define what a non-urgent visit is. We all know what it is, but it's hard to define it when we get into population studies. Um, but we all know that they happen, and we all know that they occur. So it's, it's difficult. So why is this important? Uh, why is this important at all? Why, why was I invited here to talk? So let's talk about some of those reasons. Um, it's going to save healthcare expenditure dollars, no question about that. Does anybody disagree with that? No, there's nobody who disagrees that this, I don't disagree with this. It's going to save healthcare expenditure dollars. There's no question about that. The question is how much are we going to save and how much will it cost to save something? That is the question, and we'll get there in a second. Um, another point, well, it's going to provide better continuity of care for patients. Is there any debate about that? I have no debate about that. I think if somebody has a primary care doctor, should go see the primary care doctor. It, it, there is better continuity. There's no question about that. Absolutely zero. No debate. Totally agree. All right, what about another one? Improve throughput times for that clogged emergency department. That's what it's going to do. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is not going to do that. All right? Most emergency departments can see all the non-urgent visits that you can push to them without a problem. Why is that? Well, what about the person with a stroke or the heart attack? You know, isn't that, isn't that non-urgent visit taking the bed of that? No, they are not. Uh, typically, emergency departments are set up differently so that there is a non-urgent area and if necessary, those beds can be converted into emergent sorts of beds. And those non-urgent visits, they're going to wait. They're going to wait as long as they need to wait. And that's okay, because we'll, we'll take care of the emergent critical care patients before the non-urgent stuff. And so it's not going to unclog an emergency department. When you hear that, uh, I hear it all the time. You hear it on CNN. You hear it all, all over the place. We gotta unclog those emergency departments because all those people with colds and sore throats that come in the emergency departments doesn't matter. There is, will have no effect on throughput times, length of stay, any of it. Dr. McDonald, do you agree? I do. You do, okay, there you go. Must be true. Um, I know of no, I know no emergency physician who thinks otherwise, okay? It will not affect. It. Now, there probably are other things, and there's a thing in here that I didn't put in this little something called ACOs, and so people have more skin in the game, right? And so there's a reason, there's another reason why you want to keep non-urgent visits out of the emergency department. It's going to affect people um, in a financial sort of way. Uh, so let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Let's talk about the healthcare expenditure piece of this. So the national healthcare expenditures uh, have grown 3.9, 3, uh, almost 4% in 2017. This is the latest number that I could get to. Um, and it's almost 18% of the gross national product now. 
And that's what, uh, so it's $3.5 trillion. And I kind of wanted to know what the heck does $3.5 trillion look like, and that's why I wrote it out. That's how many zeros are in $3.5 trillion. I didn't ever really know what that looked like. So that's a lot of money. And out-of-pocket spending group by 2.6 um, uh, percent to $365 billion in 2017. So that's a lot of health care expenditure in this country. Huge amount of money. Um, and I've already said we will save money. There's no question about that if we eliminate or reduce non-urgent visits to emergency departments. But how much will we save? Okay, so the cost of non-urgent emergency department care, what is it as, we can, as best we can estimate? So we take all emergency department visits, not just non-urgent, all, every single person who comes to emergency department, the estimate, the last estimate was that it's about 2% of all national health care expenditures. Now when I ask people about this, um, before I give them this number, maybe I should have asked you, you know, what, how much do you think it costs for all emergency care? And I've heard any, uh, and I talk to people who are medically sophisticated, uh, and they say, oh, it's about 30%, 30% of all health care expenditures spent on emergency care. Well, the number is 2%, but that number is now almost 10 years old, and so I put it at 3%. I figure, well, you know, it's probably gone up at least a third by then. I haven't seen the 3%. I have seen data that supports the 2%. So let's call it 3%, okay? So that's all emergency care. Um, it's the best bargain in all of medical care, so says the emergency physician, okay? Um, so let's move on. Non-urgent emergency care is estimated at about 8%, and I have a reference for that. You've heard me already say it varies from 7% up to 70%. I don't know anybody that really believes 70%, but 8% is a pretty good number. And you can put whatever number you want in there. But we're going to use 8% for the purposes of this talk. So if we eliminate all non-urgent emergency care, this is what we're going to save. $3.9 trillion times 3% times 8%. We're going to come up with $8,400,000,000. That's what we're going to save if we eliminate all of those visits. Of course, we're not going to eliminate those visits. We're not saying that the patients don't need care. We're just saying they probably don't need care in an emergency department, right? So they're going to go somewhere. Maybe they're going to go to a retail center. Maybe they're going to come to your office. They're going to go somewhere. And, and somebody's going to get reimbursed for that care. So it's not really $8 billion, $400 million that we're going to save. Some percentage of that. Maybe it's 90%, maybe it's half of that. I don't know what that is, but that's what we're talking about. $8.4 billion. Now, uh, those are the references. So how do we conclude here? So we will save money. There's no question about that. We're going to save money if we reduce non-urgent visits. Um, it's probably not as much as people think. You may think it would have been more. Again, you can go back and you can plug in whatever percentage you want. You know, if you think it's 20%, well, 20% times 3% times 3.9 trillion. That's what you'll save. But $5 billion, that is a lot of money, right? I mean, we can build a wall for $5 billion somewhere. Um, and so is it worth the experiment? We could do that, sure. Um, but efforts maybe are better spent on improving the patient health care experience. You know, I don't think anybody disagrees that uh, having these experiences, maybe those four or five patients that I outlined up front, um, would be a little bit better if um, they saw some continuity of care. And maybe that's where we ought to have our focus. All right, so our emergency department is really the victim. I mean, how did we get in the middle of all of this? You know, we, we have a mission, and our mission is to see anybody who comes to the door. And we actually have a mandate to do that. It's called EMTALA. We have to see anybody who comes to the door. We have to do that medical screening examination until such time that the patient doesn't have a medical emergency. You might say, well, what about that patient who had a pregnancy test? Does she have a medical emergency now? I don't know yet until I go and talk to him. And I go and talk to him, well, no. And so should I send her on her way? right now, no, I'm not going to do your test, uh, you don't have a medical emergency, um, uh, you can go down to Walgreens or CVS and get the test and do it yourself, or go to Planned Parenthood, or go to your PCP, or whatever you want to do, but I, okay, well, I've already, I've already done all the work, and uh, somebody's going to get billed for that medical screening exam that I have to do by federal law, um, so all patients are entitled to the medical screening examination, the EMTALA mandated medical screening examination. 
EDs are available, uh, you know, 24-7, 365, we're there, that is our mission. Um, we are proud of that. Uh, we are the safety net for healthcare in the United States. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, that. That is our mission. That is what we are there to do. Uh, we have shorter times than PCP visit, right? So you walk in, you want to be seen, uh, versus you know calling your PCP. Not too many people, at least where I am right now, not too many people can get in and be seen in you know an hour or two hours. Might be that afternoon, and maybe that's okay. But that's not what our society wants right now, and, and it, you know it's not really up to me to dictate what society wants. But so. Uh, this is what I hear from patients. You know, I, I got that appointment in an hour and a half, doctor. Should I keep it? All right. So it is quicker to be seen in the emergency department, and that's what patients want. Emphasis on quality of care. Yes, every emergency department. I don't know of any emergency department that doesn't emphasize quality of care, turnaround times, length of stay, and patient satisfaction. We have our press gaining scores and all of our metrics, just like everybody else does, and we are held accountable for that. And so if somebody comes and they want a service, the service should be fast. We should put the provider in front of them as quickly as we possibly can. The next thing patients want to do is they want to say goodbye. And they want to either go or they want to be admitted to the hospital. Okay? And they want to have a great experience. Who doesn't want that? When I go to the emergency department, that's what I want. Okay? And that's what everybody wants. And so that's how emergency departments are driven. If you go to an emergency department that works well, that's what you get. And by and large, people are successful. They're good at what they do. This is the mission. Okay. So here's some national data, 2015, from the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. And you, say, you, know, you hear all the time, well, somebody's going to go sit and wait for six hours to be seen in the emergency department. So this is national data, 2015. And what you see there is, um, gee, what is that, 67% Time spent waiting to see an MD, DO, PA, or NP less than an hour. 67% national data, it's less than an hour. It isn't six hours. Yes, there are six hour waits down there and uh, less than 1%. So those, and if, if you're the person waiting for six hours, I mean, you're not happy about that. But this is national data. When I say emergency departments are generally good at what they do. Time spent in the ED, less than one hour, one hour, but less than two hours. You take those two combinations, this is about 33%. So the visits are fairly fast. I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, so again, 67.5% of patients who come to the emergency department are seen in under an hour, and they get out pretty quickly. So they're successful at what they do. Not saying it's the best. It's just they're successful. All right, so finally, day 30, we finally get to why do patients come to the emergency department. All right, so some national health uh, statistical report. Um, this is data from 2013 and 2014, some of the most recent data that we can get on a national sort of perspective. Um, and uh, here we go, right there. If we had to break it down, I'm going to show you several more studies. But here it is. These are the reasons. Seriousness of the medical problem. 80% of people, when they go to the emergency department, they think they have a serious problem. You may know that they do not. I may know that they do not. But they don't know that they don't have a serious problem. This statistic shows up time and time again as to the reason why patients come to the emergency department. They think they have a big problem. And they think that the hospital with all its resources, is the best place for them to go, the quickest place for them to go, to get in and out and have the problem solved. All right? The, uh, they may not be correct, but that is what they think. Doctor's office or clinic was not open another 15% or so. Uh, we hear that all the time. Uh, there's a, a corollary of that. The doctor's office told me to come to the emergency department. We hear that a fair amount. And then lack of access to other providers, uh, rounding out the other 5%. So if we were to stop here and now, um, you, you, you have the reasons as to why patients come to the emergency department. But we're not going to stop now. So um, again, the reason for most recent emergency department visit this is, uh, again, uh, information culled from that same survey in 2013, 2014. The health care provider told them to go, all right? And it may not be the health care provider themselves. It may not be the physician or the mid-level provider. It may be the office. 
So somebody called, doctor isn't in, doctor's busy, mid-level provider is busy, um, and the office told them to go to the emergency department. Can't get you in. Whatever the reason is, they were told. Problem was too serious for the doctor's office. We just touched on that. Gee, I don't think my doctor's office can take care of this problem that I think I have. Comment. Only the hospital could help, similar to the, the, the previous reason. Arrived by ambulance or other emergency um, vehicle. So the ambulance was there, I caught a ride. I remember when I was uh, doing a rotation in emergency medicine when I was a student, and I, I asked the patient, you know, um, I, don't, I even forgot why I was seeing this patient, but uh, they, the patient had come by ambulance, and I asked, uh, why did you come by ambulance? And uh, the answer was, because 911 is free uh, and a cab costs money. And that was, this was in Chicago, and that's how people kind of got around, is by calling an ambulance. Um, but that was reality. All right. Doctor's office or clinic was not open. Okay, so um, you know, more and more people are having evening hours, weekend hours, off hours, but still a lot of people do not uh, have those hours. Uh, if we look at emergency department volume, the curve is the same in every emergency department in the country. Okay, the volume peaks somewhere around 10, 11, midnight. The volume diminishes through the early morning hours. Starting about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, it starts to ramp up, and it continues again until midnight. And every day is a sine wave. And so max time, 4, 5, 6, 7 o'clock. Right? Not a lot of availability for people to go see their primary care provider. Didn't have another place to go. There just wasn't any I don't have a PCP. Um, maybe I'm traveling. I got no other place to go. And so I need to get to some place that can care for me, and that's the emergency department. Uh, and the emergency room is the closest provider, so that's another reason. All right. So those are the reasons, 2013, 2014, um, based on this national survey. Uh, and there are a certain population out there that get most of their care in the emergency department. So um, I do not consider myself a primary care provider. Do I give primary care? Yes, by necessity, not by desire. I love primary care providers. I'm thankful for everything that they do because I could never do it. But we have to do it in the emergency department because oftentimes we have no other choice. Am I good at it? Probably not. Um, and I don't want to do it, but I have no other choice. All right, um, here's uh, just a, a, some of the same data in, in tabular form. And these are, um, uh, let's see if I had the pointer up here. There we go. Um, these are payers. It may be hard to read here, but um, we have Medicaid patients here, private insurance patients here, and this are uninsured patients over here. Um, so here, and this is emergency department use, and uh, in this sense, Medicaid patients were a little bit higher. Um, but look at the uninsured and the private payers. Uh, not much difference there. Um, here, it's uh, this is the seriousness question broken down by provider, and, and the fact that you, it's difficult to read these down here, it doesn't make any difference because there really is no difference. So private insurance, Medicaid insurance, uninsured, they're all around 70, 80 uh, percent. Uh, the reason they went is because they thought they had a serious problem. So whether the kind of insurance you have doesn't really make any difference there. Um, and this one's a little tough to read, so we'll, we'll skip past these. Deciding to visit the emergency department for non-urgent conditions, a systematic review of the literature. This was in the American Journal of Managed Care in 2013. What did we learn from this? <clears throat> we learned that the data is not very robust. Um, it is a challenge. This is what they came up with. Age. Younger adults more likely to have non-urgent visits than older adults, and I find this to be true, um, especially the millennial generation. Okay, and it's not a, 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 a negative comment about the millennial generation, but um, all the time we'll take care of these patients. Uh, these are uh, insured, employed, younger patients who have a legitimate problem in uh, being seen for whatever that might be. Could have been taken maybe uh, care of by a primary care doctor. Do you have a primary care provider? No, I do not. Do you want one? No, I do not. Okay? They don't want one. 
Uh, they want uh, kind of care on demand, uh, and they want it when they want it. And uh, it, it isn't that they've had a bad relationship, they just don't see the need to have one. Um, and uh, I find that to be true. Um, race, five out of nine articles in this review study said there's no association with race with regard to emergency department non-urgent visits. Gender, no convincing evidence either way. Income, half the studies said lower income were more likely to make non-urgent visits, but half said they weren't. So it doesn't seem to make much difference there. Insurance, mixed results across the board. Um, perceived severity, four articles, again, 80% felt that their condition could not wait. They could not wait. The reason keeps coming back. That's what the patients believe. Convenience. Three articles report that convenience is a factor, ease of use. 60% of non-urgent visits, the users reported the ED was just more convenient to go than their PCP. All right? It was too tough to get to their primary care provider. Too difficult. Easier to go to the emergency department. All right. And so they came up with this kind of... Um, uh, diagram here, and I thought that this was interesting, the concept, conceptual model uh, for non-urgent visits. And so you, know, you have uh, a patient who's experiencing symptoms, and so, um, gee, what are they going to do? So what's that perceived severity? How sick do I think I am? What are your general beliefs and knowledge about maybe the condition that you have? Um, what kind of convenience are you looking for at that moment in time? What is the access availability? What's the cost going to be? Not too many people think too much about the cost at all. Um, and I'll give you a story in a second. Um, and what's the advice? So, so the patient experiences the visits, uh, ex uh, experiences symptoms. They think about all these things, and then here are their options. They can do nothing. They can self-medicate and go see their PCP, go to the emergency department, or go somewhere else. And then all these other things, age, all the things we just talked about, um, have some component, uh, some influence but that's basically kind of the thought process boiled down in a one-page diagram. And I think that that's probably pretty good. Depending on the patient, all of these factors play a role. And so as you sit there thinking, well, how can I influence this then? Which one of these things can I, as a physician or a care provider, what can I influence? Okay? That's the question. That's how we're going to keep non-urgent visits out of the emergency department. What can you influence? Will you? influence it. It's not so easy, as we'll get to in a second. I was going to tell you a story, but I don't think we have time, so we'll keep going. Maybe I'll tell you later. Um, this just looks at uh, uh, patients of lower socioeconomic status, why they do prefer hospitals over ambulatory care, and they kind of divide it into two patient populations, what they call a kind of a group uh, A and B. And basically, um, this group of patients perceived it as being less expensive, more accessible, higher quality they thought that going to a hospital in the emergency department get higher quality care um, than going to uh, ambulatory care. That was their belief. All right, so finally now we get to some solutions. What has worked, what hasn't worked? And um, there are a couple things that absolutely do work. Can't wait to hear them, I'm sure. All right, so the effectiveness of emergency department visit reduction programs, a systematic review. And in this paper, they looked at several papers and looked at the quality of the evidence. And the, the downer here is that a lot of the papers that are out there are of poor quality. And so when statistics get mentioned and numbers get thrown out, you kind of got to go back and look at, well, where did that number come from? What was the quality of the study? So this is what they found. They evaluated 38 studies, 13 of which were high, in their estimation, high quality studies between the years of 2003 and 2014. Nine targeted low acuity visits, four targeted high risk populations. And so we're kind of talking about two different populations here. There's the non-urgent visit overall, okay? And then there's the high risk patient population, oftentimes with a chronic illness, that have frequent visits, okay? That's the patient that has 100, 200, 250 emergency department visits in a year. They are different. And the ways to attack those are also different. For example, in our emergency department, we have a group called the FEDS group. We named it FEDS for Frequent Emergency Department Seekers. 
And that group meets once a month, and it's a group of physicians and nurses and social workers and case managers and all kinds of folks from primary care. And they look at that chronic illness group that has 60, 70, 80, 100 visits to the emergency department, trying to figure out why and, and how to make that better. And they've been successful, but it's a, and I'll tell you about it uh, more in a, in a minute, but um, it's a lot of work to do that. Only case management consistently reduced ED use in high-risk patients. So that population that I was just talking about, the way that they, it, they did that was they took nurses and they made a lot of phone calls. And they know these patients well. And often, sometimes they're calling them every single day. And, and they knew the patients and they knew their life and they knew their spouses and they knew everything about them. And uh, they knew what was going on and they knew the triggers of what was going to cause Mr. Smith to come to the emergency department and they were on top of it all the time. And as long as they did that, those patients would not come to the emergency department. As soon as somebody went on vacation, they did come to the emergency department. So an enormous amount of work, but case management does work, okay? It does work. Financial disincentives or co-pays had mixed results, but a lot of studies will show that they have worked well. And that's why insurance companies have high co-pays because they work. Some of the original data from Kaiser, more Medicaid data from the state of Oregon, those data looked at co-pays of $50 to $100. My co-pay to go to the emergency department is $400. Um, co-pays work. There is a reason why they exist. The quality studies um, were, was quite limited, uh, they found. Less than a third of ED reduction programs were moderate to high quality studies. And so you have to be careful when you're looking at these things. Are the studies good? Or are they not so great? Conclusion, we need better studies. Okay, and here's some of the studies. And uh, what you'll look at here is um, uh, what works over here. So the whys uh, are, yes, they worked. The fours, for whatever reason, we, uh, the N's or no's came out as fours. So those didn't work so well. So you see that uh, study after study with regard to financial penalty, most of the time they're working and case management does work. Navigation and care coordination didn't really work. Acute disease management and education. So I'm going to tell you more about your asthma. Um, that in and of itself didn't work so well. Linkage to primary care and care coordination. Uh, we are going to get you a PCP. We're going to communicate with your PCP. Your PCP is going to hear about your emergency department visit, and they're going to communicate with you. That didn't work so well in this particular study, um, and a couple of studies didn't work so well. All right, so case management works, and financial disincentive works. But it's not as bleak as it sounds, okay? Well, let's talk about the low acuity patient. There are some subsets, and they looked at them. And so uh, three studies looked at, at low acuity patients. One, patients with anxiety disorders. And here, so somebody comes in with anxiety disorder, they have a lot of frequent visits, they're non-urgent visits, they just have anxiety, and so they linked them up to telephone follow-up, one-on-one, -on -one, and they had a, a reduction in repeat visits. Now, it doesn't look like that reduction is all that important. Gee, we went down to 0.26 compared to 0.39, but it is a reduction. And so they're at one-on-one -on -one feedback, in this particular patient population. Would that work for other patient populations? My gut tells me yes, it hasn't really been studied to any huge degree on any large scale, but I think probably yes. This one, the second one is disappointing to me. Here, geriatric patients, they met with a geriatric nurse. There was a needs assessment done. There was a summary given to the primary care provider, and there was phone call follow-up. So it obviously didn't, uh, had nothing to do with that first visit, but did it reduce subsequent visits? No, it didn't. And that's very disappointing to me because we just started a geriatric emergency department uh, down, uh, downtown. And uh, we will be studying this as we go forward. I mean, it, intuitively, it seems like it should work. But in this particular study, it didn't work. Uninsured patients with no PCP, they got advocates for them. They said, here are all the PCPs. Who would you like to go to? You like uh, uh, Dr. Smith? Great. We're going to make an appointment. Um, there's a phone call, there's a follow-up, uh, in-person stuff, and that didn't work either. So that was a little bit disappointing for the low acuity patients. All right. This is a very interesting um, piece of information from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on reducing inappropriate ED visits um, 
and focusing on primary care. So Robert Wood Johnson put out a lot of money to 16 different communities across the country for them to try different things in reducing ED visits and increasing quality of care. And they were successful. So uh, they found that there were three things that were really important. Collaboration, transparency, and engagement. And so that sounds great. What does all that mean? This is what it means. So collaboration in Detroit, and we're going to concentrate on this Detroit project in just a second. They were able to reduce avoidable ED visits by increasing communication and especially after hours access. They had same day appointments including evenings and weekends. They had live voices answering the phone, directing the patients where they should go. And this was their data. They went from 49 visits per 1,000 patients down to 7.3 per 1,000 for PCP treatable conditions. So big success on how they did that. Um, referral to homes, especially for chronic care conditions, COPD, diabetes, hypertension, HIV, AIDS, getting a patient in a medical home, reduced emergency department visits, 44% reduction in Wisconsin. Another big thing that many areas have done is they've created a much more robust, robust healthcare information exchange. Uh, Massachusetts, as good as, as it is, um, is way behind in a lot of other states in the country. Uh, our ability to get information from one hospital that's not in your network is not so great. We all know that. You know, she had a study done somewhere else. I can't get the study. I have no idea what the study is um, or what the visit is or what the information is. They are much better in other states. Indiana is another uh, state that uh, is very good. Um, this is difficult to read, um, but uh, this is the Detroit experience in primary care guys. And what they, they had this four-step process, and they studied it, and they looked at it, and it was success successful. So number one was they developed a written access to care policy. So when a patient joins the practice, they come up with a written um, uh, document for the patient. But they also talk with their staff about how patients are going to access medical care. And they're very clear about that. Who is going to be able to interact with the patient when the patient calls? Is it the front office worker? Is it a mid-level provider? Is it the physician? Is it the nurse? Who is it and what's going to be said? Um, they create scripts on that information. How many times have you called his office? So please listen to the entire menu because the menu has changed, right? That never changes. The menu is always changing, constantly changing. You always hear that. And then you hear the various options from that recorded voice. Um, sometimes the very first one is, if you have an emergency, please hang up and call 911, right? You hear that all the time. All right, well, they, hear, they still have that, but it's at the end. It's at the end. So they take away that immediate option right up front. Uh, and they put it at the end. I think that's probably a good idea. Is, you know, again, people think that their problem is serious. Uh, include after hours instructions from new patient materials. So for every new patient that joins a practice, they tell them exactly the expectations of the practice. If you have after hours needs, this is who you call, and this is who you're going to talk to, and we're going to help you out. And they make that uh, whole thing a point of conversation as well. If anybody's interested in this, we can get you the um, uh, information. It'll be much easier for you to read. So this was studied, and it was um, published. And here's basically what they found. So there's three groups here in uh, the Detroit area. Um, and in every single one of those, in the control versus the intervention, the non-urgent visits went down. You know, three different studies. They all went down. So it worked. It seemed to work pretty well. And uh, this is just an example letter. So, you know, gosh, my patient went to the emergency department. It seems as though that was an avoidable thing. This is a sample letter that they send to their patients. You know, gosh, you were there. Uh, we reviewed this. Um, here's a little bit about emergency care, a little bit of information about how to contact the office next time. You know, and so they bring it up. They bring it up at every visit. Every time you go, the, somebody comes. Uh, the medical assistant, as they're um, uh, putting the patient in the room, talks about these things. It's constant, all the time, communication back to the patient, and it works. Here's a little bit more information about the Detroit system. Uh, now, they got $10 million from Robert Wood Johnson to do this. So $10 million is a lot of money. Um, and uh, 
They basically create a gateway system, so patients are coming, again, kind of post-visit, now that they had a non-urgent visit, um, they set them up to the system, and uh, it was successful. So they looked, uh, they had a very extensive medical record. Um, they looked at patients who had five visits or more per year. Uh, they had a multidisciplinary team, um, a lot of behavioral health resources put in place, social work, pharmacy, dietary. Uh, and basically, they found that with that and, and some expansion of after-hours care, they were able to significantly reduce um, non-urgent visits to emergency departments, so much so that they're getting more. Somebody thinks that it's working, so they're getting more money to do it. Point being, you need money to save money. You spend money to save money. It's really hard to do this by yourself without a systems approach. And in this case, it was $10 million. It seemed to help a little bit. Transparency, the Oregon Healthcare Quality Cooperation, they actually measure and report EDUs regardless of the network. So no matter what network your patient goes to, the ED visit is recorded, reported back to the primary care provider as information. They can turn around and give feedback to the patient. In Wisconsin, they do the same thing. It allows coaching of the patients about their, their use. Engagement. Here in New Mexico, they actually had an ad campaign. They went out and, and put up billboards and all kinds of things, uh, public uh, announcements. And they were able to reduce visits. Now, this is over four hospitals, 1,573 visits. Probably not a lot. I'm not sure that this was the best utilization of the um, dollars that they were given, but they did reduce non-urgent visits. So again, kind of falls in the education front. Another paper in academic emergency medicine, non-emergency department interventions to reduce ED utilization. So interventions outside of the emergency department. We'll talk about emergency department interventions as well. What worked? To find those is implemented outside the ED. This is for the paper. It included five separate categories. Patient education, so appropriate use of the ED and your medical condition. Creation of additional non-ED capacity, expand the hours, same the access. Managed care, they looked at managed care papers, decapitation or gatekeeping approach. Pre-hospital diversion, well EMS is gonna take the patient directly to maybe a community health center or there's gonna be direct diversion right at triage. Patient comes, hey I have a medication refill, great, you're not gonna be in the EDO somewhere else. Uh, they looked at that and patient financial incentives or disincentives, co-payments and deductibles. So these were the um, interventions that they looked at and here's the findings. 27 to 39 studies showed reduction in ED use. Great, that was positive, very positive. One of them even showed 80% reduction in ED use. Show me the 80% right now, I wanna see it. Okay, I'll show you in a second. Nearly all studies were observational often with other changes made, so not just one thing. And I think that that's a lesson in all of this. It isn't just one thing, it's many things. When these studies are done, they're often looking at one intervention. But you can imagine, we can do multiple interventions and we're gonna have success. Case management, financial disincentives, increased access, increased after hours, a lot of case management, a lot of callbacks, a lot of patient education, all of these things together, not any one by themselves, all of them together are going to reduce non-urgent visits. The largest reductions were using financial disincentives and managed care. All right, so those $400 copays, again, they work. Um, less than 50% of studies on, uh, on increasing non-ED capacity, so if you just re increase the non-ED capacity, the after hour stuff, didn't work all by itself. You had to do other things. And patient education, one study resulted in 80% reduction. So this was somebody with ear pain, probably kids with ear pain. And so when they talked with the family and the patients about their condition, really educated them quite well about that, uh, they did this standardized education approach. They had 24-hour follow-up. They reduced repeat visits by 80%. So it wasn't so much the ear pain, right? It's really the education, the follow-up, the repeat phone calls, all of that stuff. It works. What are the consequences? So um, we look at the financial copay stuff, you know, are there some unintended consequences that are gonna happen there? Are we gonna keep patients out of the emergency department who really need to be there? You know, they don't think twice about coming. That's the concern of a lot of people. We don't know. Um, we think that probably that will happen. And that's where you see a lot of pushback about the co-pays. Um, yes, is there 
other incentives on the part of emergency providers. You bet. I said that in the very beginning. That's how I get paid. But ultimately, we're there to take care of patients, and we are the safety net, and we want people to get care when they come to the emergency department if they need care. Um, so you have to think about that. All right, so what about those things in the emergency department? What can we do in the emergency department? So 23 studies were looked at in this particular paper. Again, variable effectiveness, 17 studies performed in a single center. So you say, gosh, that was just one center, 17 different studies. I guess this is a hot topic for those guys. And they found that outpatient coordination was effective. Um, if you made those appointments for people and you did the follow-up, it was effective. Electronic communication worked about half the time. So I think that really depends. What are you doing with the electronic communication? Okay, yeah, my patient was there. Okay, that's great. Um, or is there follow-up? Is there a letter written? Is there a phone call made? Um, all of those things we've already talked about. So electronic communication is great, but you've got to do something with it. And in some cases, the primary care uh, follow-up even worsened. Uh, they weren't sure why. There were some hypotheses that were thrown out there. Maybe the PCP relationship wasn't all that great. Maybe there was no PCP relationship. Um, there's even some suggestion that the follow-up reminding somebody with a chronic illness of their illness. And so, you know, those folks are in denial. They don't want to be reminded of their illness. And so um, maybe that was something there. All right, so we're circling all the way back. We're at the end of the talk. We're going to go back to those original patients. And did they need to come to the ED or not? All right. So number one, 28-year-old female requesting medication. Well, it kind of depends. What do you think medication she was looking for? Any thoughts? Narcotics. 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 She was looking for narcotics, right? So when you see that, when emergency physician sees that on the board, medication refills, you have two thoughts. Number one, it's the easiest thing in the world. I'm going to knock this out. Number two, it's somebody looking for narcotics. Easiest thing in the world. Actually, in our day, we, we, we attack that by saying we have a policy. We are not going to feel anybody's narcotic represcription. We are not going to feel chronic pain. We'll take care of acute pain. We will not feel uh, an opioid or a narcotic prescription period in a story that's a policy. Gets everybody off the hook. So I'm sorry, I'd love to do this for you, um, but it's uh, the policy of the department that we not do that. This was not a narcotic. This is a patient who had um, been on antibiotics. She gets yeast infections um, all the time whenever that happens. She had asked her doctor for a Diflucan prescription, which her doctor provided her. She misplaced that prescription. She placed a phone call to the primary care provider. They had not called her back yet. Um, and so she came to the emergency department to get the prescription, the medication refill. Avoidable? Absolutely. Why did she do it? Convenient? It was faster. We had faster turnaround time than, than her office could call her back. Right or wrong? No. Um, could it have been better? Absolutely. Was I frustrated? You bet. Did it take me two seconds to do? You, yes, it did. 25-year-old uh, female requesting pregnancy test. Urgent, non-urgent. There was no magic here. Just thought maybe she was pregnant. That's all. Um, what was I going to do? I sent her down the road to CVS. So she's already there. Did the pregnancy test. Um, by the way, she had an implantable um, estrogen, and um, so low probability that she was pregnant. She was not pregnant, but she went away happy. 58-year-old female with severe back pain. This is severe back pain, uh, radiculopathy, known radiculopathy. Um, has a primary care doctor, has a neurosurgeon, has a rheumatologist, has a pain clinic physician, has every subspecialist known to mankind, um, and in fact had seen the neurosurgeon relatively recently, been scheduled for a laminectomy, uh, which was postponed uh, for doing another study. And here she was in the emergency department. She took gabapentin and some non steroid, was not a narcotics, and not looking for narcotics. Nothing had changed in her course, nothing had changed in her symptoms, um, nothing had changed in her findings. And she had all these people, but yet she was in the emergency department because she was having pain. Um, why did she come? Convenient? Frustration? I'm not sure why she came. You can imagine me, I'm thinking of this woman with known disease. What am I missing? This, this is my thought process. What am I missing? What red flag am I missing? Tomorrow this person's not going to be walking. She's going to have some other lesions. Something's going on. You know, I spent a half an hour going through all these notes from all these people. She had great care. I wasn't missing anything. So I treated her pain and sent her on her way. Could she have gone to her primary care doctor? You bet. Was I glad that I was there to help her? Yes. But was it a good use of everybody's resources?
course, probably not. Why was she there? All those reasons we talked about. The 26-year-old female with a lump under her arm for two months. It wasn't an abscess. I don't know what it was. It was something. But she got follow-up. Did she need to be there? No. Why was she there? All of the reasons we just talked about. Um, prevent me from seeing somebody with a heart attack or a stroke or somebody. No, it did not. Um, could we have kept her out? I'm sure we could have. So that's the conclusion of my talk. Those are the reasons why your patients come to the emergency department. Um, those are some strategies on how to keep your patients out of the ED. There's a lot of work that we've done. Thank you for allowing me to come and talk this morning.